Greetings, everyone. My name is Larry Williams, and I'm the director of the Center for the Advancement of Research Methods and Analysis, or CARMA, here at Wayne State University. Uh, it is February 18th, 2011, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to another version of Meet the Methodologist. And uh, we are extremely honored to have as our guest today uh, Dr. Peter Bentler from the University of California, Los Angeles, uh, where he is Distinguished Professor of Psychology and Statistics. And Peter is here doing a webcast lecture in about two hours on formative measures. Uh, but in this particular session, we take the opportunity to chat with him and to learn some about his career and perspectives and uh, advice that he might have to offer for uh, young faculty members and senior faculty members and graduate students and anybody that's involved in scholarship and social science research. So, Peter, welcome. So, uh, we're going to go back and uh, I'd like to get you to comment on uh, what life was like as a graduate student at Stanford in the early 60s. Well, it's uh, it's kind of a uh, very lengthy topic. Uh, the 60s uh, were a very exciting time, and um, of course, uh, for any old guy like me, looking back at a time like that, it was always fabulous. But it was challenging and difficult, and you remember probably that. Uh, that was the beginning of the civil rights movement in the South, and a lot of my fellow grad students traveled down there at that time. Um, that was uh, the time of the assassination of uh, President Kennedy. I remember being in a lecture by Jolly West, uh, who later became the director of the NPI at UCLA, when we heard this announcement and the lecture stopped. and. Uh, so there were a lot of things going on. It was an exciting time from that standpoint. It was also interesting intellectually from my own personal de development. Um, I had come up through anthropology and uh, sociology and then social psychology and was starting in clinical psych, but it was clear at Stanford that psychology over the next decades was going to go in one of several directions. And one of these was obviously the behavioral one, with Al Bandura starting to obviously be a star already at, at his young age at that point. And it was clear that was going to be a big movement. Uh, with uh, uh, neuropsychology, uh, with Carl Bre Prebam uh, talking about uh, TOTE mechanisms and so on. It was very clear that neurosciences were going to take off. And finally, uh, uh, there was a lot of emphasis, or, or at least uh, atmosphere, about the mathematicalization of psychology, with uh, Atkinson there, Estes there, uh, Pat Supis in philosophy, not to speak of the statisticians, uh, Olkin and others, and so on. And so as I was starting to study clinical psychology and becoming a little bit interested in hypnosis and the measurement of individual differences and so on, um, I was starting to think ahead and, and ask myself, you know, what do I need to know over the next 30 years in order to be competitive? down the road. And I decided in the long run I was going to have to learn more about quantitative methods because my background in it was, was pretty bad. So that, those are the kind of things that I remember about it. Yeah. So, uh, so then uh, can you tell, a little, tell us a little bit more about how that interest in quantitative uh, methods emerged and uh, was there anything other than uh, the belief that this would be something that would serve you well over your career that kind of uh, helped stimulate you in that area? Well, uh, Jerry Wiggins was there at the time and he taught a course in personality assessment and he was uh, one of the early people to emphasize uh, quantitative methods as an aspect of it. And the actually there were I.O. parts to it. Uh, there was a lot of uh, Gazelli's work on 
personality and prediction and interaction effects and so on and the kind of models that would work and hold up and would not hold up. So I just started realizing I was just going to have to learn a little more. Quinn McAmar was there. I was uh, studying uh, classical test theory from him and basic statistics and so on. But I didn't specialize in it. At that time I was trying to finish my clinical work uh, because I thought I needed that and wanted to do that and uh, have that as a career emphasis. And I did maintain that for about 10 years, but then I kind of gave up on it and moved more and more into quantitative. And I can't say there was any given moment. I think it's what often happens to people. You get, you have a little bit of success, and you do a little bit more of it. And if you have a little more success at it, you do a little more of it. And that's kind of how I got into it. Yeah. <laughs> so who were some of the important, uh, I know you've mentioned several people, but yeah. who were some of the most important influences on you during the early stages of your career, and, and as you look back, what type of impact did they have on you? Not just at, uh, at Stanford, but uh, what you, once you returned back to, uh, to UCLA. Well, I tried to early on uh, get a concept of what creativity meant in the scientific field that I was embarking on and tried to see the differences between people who were developing really original new ideas and those who were not doing so. And one of the, uh, one of the uh, interesting influences on me was by Henry Kaiser. I had communicated with him. He was at uh, Berkeley at that time. I never met him, but I had corresponded with him, and he was very encouraging and uh, urged me to read, for example, uh, Gutman and so on, urged me to, to do readings. He gave me advice that uh, I wasn't quite getting locally. On the other hand, I worked uh, a lot with uh, uh, Doug Jackson, who later became quite well known in personality measurement. And his uh, level of integrity and uh, concern with doing quantitative methods right in the measurement of psychological constructs I just found to be kind of inspiring and, and uh, was a model I tried to follow. Yeah. Uh, Peter, um, I'm particularly uh, interested in uh, scholars who have a balance of substantive interests and methodological interests. And, uh, that certainly is a balance that, that you have maintained over the, over the years. And I was wondering whether you could comment on how you see your substantive work uh, as having uh, informed or motivated your work as a methodologist. And uh, are there any types of examples that come to mind uh, where your expertise as a methodologist informed your identification of substantive questions and how you uh, approach those substantive questions? Uh, there's no question uh, that uh, substantive uh, helped me focus my quantitative work. In fact, um, among psychometricians, uh, I'm one of the few that actually has, has had an active empirical psychological mm -hmm. research program. And for the last 20 or 30 years, that's been focused on adolescent drug use, correlates, consequences of adolescent drug use. And in drug use, there are non-normal distributions. Uh, for example, uh, uh, heavy drugs like heroin in the normal population, you've got a lot of people down at zero and maybe a few at the other end. These are not normally distributed variables. And when uh, Euroscog developed structural modeling, it was all developed based on the assumption of multivariate normality, and I was not finding data that met those assumptions when dealing with drug use data. And so I have made it really a career-long emphasis to try to find and develop statistical methods that would hold under violation of classical assumptions. And those to be relevant to the kind of work that I actually did in practice and that I know other people faced. I mean, I, I didn't think I was unique in facing these kind of problems. Uh -huh. So, uh, 
as we headed through the 70s, then in 1980, uh, you published the first of several articles that have become seminal papers on goodness of fit indices for structural equation models. And uh, Peter, what do you recall about the forces that shaped your interest in this specific topic? And as you look back now over the 30 years since their publication, what do you think is most misunderstood about your views on this topic? You know, I don't know what's misunderstood. Um, um, what shaped my interest in, in this, again, was empirical research. Uh, yours called, uh, emphasized statistical methods and statistical tests. And these were basically null hypothesis testing, except kind of inverted because with structural modeling, you want to accept the null hypothesis instead of reject it. But nonetheless, there was this emphasis on statistical testing. And the reality was, with real data, uh, especially with reasonably large sample sizes, people were finding it was essentially very, very hard, if not impossible, to accept the null hypothesis. And so I started thinking about the analogy to regression. And in regression, with R squared, R squared is a continuous measure. And in regression, there's a well-known distinction between, quote, statistical significance and practical significance. And statistical significance answers an important question, but it's probably not the most important question. The most important question is, how well can you actually predict? Yes, you want to be able to predict better than chance, but that doesn't really tell you how well you are doing. And so. I thought uh, we needed something analogous uh, in structural equation modeling and, and uh, then came up uh, with these fit indices as a way to measure those.